Chapter twenty five, part two of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Terence went upstairs, stood inside the door to take Helen's directions, looked over at Rachel, but did not attempt to speak to her. She appeared vaguely conscious of his presence, but it seemed to disturb her, and she turned so that she lay with her back to him. For six days, indeed, she had been oblivious of the world outside, because it needed all her attention to follow the hot, red, quick sights which passed incessantly before her eyes. She knew that it was of enormous importance that she should attend to these sights and grasp their meaning, but she was always being just too late to hear or see something which would explain it all. For this reason, the faces, Helen's face, the nurses, Terence's, the doctors, which occasionally forced themselves very close to her, were worrying because they distracted her attention and she might miss the clue. However, on the fourth afternoon she was suddenly unable to keep Helen's face distinct from the sights themselves. Her lips widened as she bent down over the bed and she began to gabble unintelligibly like the rest. The sights were all concerned in some plot, some adventure, some escape. The nature of what they were doing changed incessantly, although there was always a reason behind it, which she must endeavour to grasp. Now they were among trees and savages, now they were on the sea. Now they were on the tops of high towers. Now they jumped, now they flew. But just as the crisis was about to happen, something invariably slipped in her brain, so that the whole effort had to begin over again. The heat was suffocating. At last the faces went further away. She fell into a deep pool of sticky water which eventually closed over her head. She saw nothing and heard nothing but a faint booming sound, which was the sound of the sea rolling over her head. While all her tormentors thought that she was dead, she was not dead, but curled up at the bottom of the sea. There she lay, sometimes seeing darkness, sometimes light, while every now and then someone turned her over at the bottom of the sea. After St. John had spent some hours in the heat of the sun wrangling with evasive and very garrulous natives, he extracted the information that there was a doctor, a French doctor, who was at present away on a holiday in the hills. It was quite impossible, so they said, to find him. With his experience of the country, St. John thought it unlikely that a telegram would either be sent or received, but having reduced the distance of the hill town in which he was staying from a hundred miles to thirty miles, and having hired a carriage and horses, he started at once to fetch the doctor himself. He succeeded in finding him and eventually forced the unwilling man to leave his young wife and return forthwith. They reached the villa at midday on Tuesday. Terence came out to receive them, and St. John was struck by the fact that he had grown perceptibly thinner in the interval. He was white, too. His eyes looked strange but the curt speech and the sulky masterful manner of Dr. Lesage impressed them both favourably, although at the same time it was obvious that he was very much annoyed at the whole affair. Coming downstairs he gave his directions emphatically, but it never occurred to him to give an opinion, either because of the presence of Rodriguez, who was now obsequious as well as malicious or because he took it for granted that they already knew what was to be known. Of course, he said with a shrug of his shoulders, when Terence asked him, is she very ill? 
they were both conscious of a certain sense of relief when Dr. Lesage was gone, leaving explicit directions and promising another visit in a few hours' time. But unfortunately the rise of their spirits led them to talk more than usual, and in talking they quarrelled. They quarrelled about a road, the Portsmouth Road, St. John said that it was macadamized where it passed his hind head, and Terence knew as well as he knew his own name that it is not macadamized at that point. In the course of the argument they said some very sharp things to each other, and the rest of the dinner was eaten in silence, save for an occasional half-stifled reflection from Ridley. When it grew dark and the lamps were brought in, Terence felt unable to control his irritation any longer. St. John went to bed in a state of complete exhaustion, bidding Terence good night with rather more affection than usual because of their quarrel, and Ridley retired to his books. Left alone, Terence walked up and down the room. He stood at the open window. The lights were coming out one after another in the town beneath, and it was very peaceful and cool in the garden, so that he stepped out on to the terrace. As he stood there in the darkness, able only to see the shapes of trees through the fine grey light, he was overcome by a desire to escape, to have done with this suffering, to forget that Rachel was ill. He allowed himself to lapse into forgetfulness of everything, as if a wind that had been raging incessantly suddenly fell asleep. The fret and strain and anxiety which had been pressing on him passed away. He seemed to stand in an unvexed space of air, on a little island by himself. He was free and immune from pain. It did not matter whether Rachel was well or ill, it did not matter whether they were apart or together, nothing mattered, nothing mattered. The waves beat on the shore far away and the soft wind passed through the branches of the trees, seeming to encircle him with peace and security, with dark and nothingness. Surely the world of strife and fret and anxiety was not the real world, but this was the real world, the world that lay beneath the superficial world, so that whatever happened one was secure. The quiet and peace seemed to lap his body in a fine cool sheet, soothing every nerve. His mind seemed once more to expand and become natural. But when he had stood thus for a time, a noise in the house roused him. He turned instinctively and went into the drawing-room. The sight of the lamp-lit room brought back so abruptly all that he had forgotten, that he stood for a moment unable to move. He remembered everything, the hour, the minute even, what point they had reached and what was to come. He cursed himself for making believe for a minute that things were different from what they are. The night was now harder to face than ever. Unable to stay in the empty drawing-room, he wandered out and sat on the stairs halfway up to Rachel's room. He longed for someone to talk to, but Hurst was asleep and Ridley was asleep. There was no sound in Rachel's room. The only sound in the house was the sound of Chailey moving in the kitchen. At last there was a rustling on the stairs overhead, and Nurse McGuinness came down, fastening the links in her cuffs, in preparation for the night's watch. Terence rose and stopped her. He had scarcely spoken to her, but it was possible that she might confirm him in his belief, which still persisted in his mind, that Rachel was not seriously ill. 
He told her in a whisper that Dr. Lesage had been, and what he had said. Now, nurse, he whispered, please tell me your opinion. Do you consider that she is very seriously ill? Is she in any danger? The doctor has said, she began. Yes, but I want your opinion. You have had experience of many cases like this. I could not tell you more than Dr. Lesage, Mr. Hewitt, she replied cautiously, as though her words might be used against her. The case is serious, but you may feel quite certain that we are doing all we can for Miss Vinrace. She spoke with some professional self-approbation, but she realized perhaps that she did not satisfy the young man who still blocked her way for she shifted her feet slightly upon the stair and looked out of the window where they could see the moon over the sea. If you ask me, she began in a curiously stealthy tone, I never like May for my patients. May? Terence repeated. It may be a fancy, but I don't like to see anybody fall ill in May, she continued. Things seem to go wrong in May. Perhaps it's the moon. They say the moon affects the brain, don't they, sir? He looked at her, but he could not answer her. Like all the others, when one looked at her, she seemed to shrivel beneath one's eyes and become worthless, malicious, and untrustworthy. She slipped past him and disappeared. Though he went to his room he was unable even to take his clothes off. For a long time he paced up and down, and then, leaning out of the window, gazed at the earth which lay so dark against the paler blue of the sky. With a mixture of fear and loathing he looked at the slim black cypress trees which were still visible in the garden and heard the unfamiliar creaking and grating sounds which show that the earth is still hot. All these sights and sounds appeared sinister and full of hostility and foreboding. Together with the natives and the nurse and the doctor and the terrible force of the illness itself, they seemed to be in conspiracy against him. They seemed to join together in their effort to extract the greatest possible amount of suffering from him. He could not get used to his pain. It was a revelation to him. He had never realized before that underneath every action, underneath the life of every day, pain lies, quiescent, but ready to devour. He seemed to be able to see suffering, as if it were a fire curling up over the edges of all action, eating away the lives of men and women. He thought for the first time with understanding of words which had before seemed to him empty, the struggle of life, the hardness of life. Now he knew for himself that life is hard and full of suffering. He looked at the scattered lights in the town beneath, and thought of Arthur and Susan, of Evelyn and Parrot, venturing out unwittingly, and by their happiness laying themselves open to suffering such as this. How did they dare to love each other, he wondered. How had he himself dared to live as he had lived, rapidly and carelessly, passing from one thing to another, loving Rachel as he had loved her? Never again would he feel secure. He would never believe in the stability of life, or forget what depths of pain lie beneath small happiness and feelings of content and safety. It seemed to him as he looked back that their happiness had never been so great as his pain was now. There had always been something imperfect in their happiness something they had wanted and had not been able to get. It had been fragmentary and incomplete, because they were so young 
and had not known what they were doing. The light of his candle flickered over the boughs of a tree outside the window, and as the branch swayed in the darkness there came before his mind a picture of all the world that lay outside his window. He thought of the immense river and the immense forest, the vast stretches of dry earth and the plains of the sea that encircled the earth. From the sea the sky rose steep and enormous, and the air washed profoundly between the sky and the sea. How vast and dark it must be to-night, lying exposed to the wind, and in all this great space it was curious to think how few the towns were, and how small little rings of light or single glow-worms he figured them, scattered here and there among the swelling uncultivated folds of the world. And in those towns were little men and women, tiny men and women. Oh, it was absurd, when one thought of it, to sit here in a little room, suffering and caring. What did anything matter? Rachel, a tiny creature, lay ill beneath him, and here in his little room he suffered on her account. The nearness of their bodies in this vast universe, and the minuteness of their bodies, seemed to him absurd and laughable. Nothing mattered, he repeated. They had no power, no hope. He leant on the window sill, thinking until he almost forgot the time and the place. Nevertheless, although he was convinced that it was absurd and laughable, and that they were small and hopeless, he never lost the sense that these thoughts somehow formed part of a life which he and Rachel would live together. Owing, perhaps, to the change of doctor, Rachel appeared to be rather better next day. Terribly pale and worn, though Helen looked, there was a slight lifting of the cloud which had hung all these days in her eyes. She talked to me she said voluntarily. She asked me what day of the week it was, like herself. Then suddenly, without any warning or any apparent reason, the tears formed in her eyes and rolled steadily down her cheeks. She cried with scarcely any attempt at movement of her features, and without any attempt to stop herself, as if she did not know that she was crying. In spite of the relief which her words gave him, Terence was dismayed by the sight. Had everything given way? Were there no limits to the power of this illness? Would everything go down before it? Helen had always seemed to him strong and determined, and now she was like a child. He took her in his arms, and she clung to him like a child crying softly and quietly upon his shoulder. Then she roused herself and wiped her tears away. It was silly to behave like that, she said. Very silly, she repeated. When there could be no doubt that Rachel was better. She asked Terence to forgive her for her folly. She stopped at the door and came back and kissed him without saying anything. On this day, indeed, Rachel was conscious of what went on round her. She had come to the surface of the dark, sticky pool, and a wave seemed to bear her up and down with it. She had ceased to have any will of her own. She lay on the top of the wave, conscious of some pain, but chiefly of weakness. The wave was replaced by the side of a mountain. Her body became a drift of melting snow, above which her knees rose in huge peaked mountains of bare bone. It was true that she saw Helen and saw her room. 
but everything had become very pale and semi-transparent. Sometimes she could see through the wall in front of her. Sometimes when Helen went away she seemed to go so far that Rachel's eyes could hardly follow her. The room also had an odd power of expanding, and though she pushed her voice out as far as possible until sometimes it became a bird and flew away, she thought it doubtful whether it ever reached the person she was talking to. There were immense intervals or chasms, for things still had the power to appear visibly before her, between one moment and the next. It sometimes took an hour for Helen to raise her arm, pausing long between each jerky movement, and pour out medicine. Helen's form stooping to raise her in bed appeared of gigantic size, and came down upon her like the ceiling falling. But for long spaces of time she would merely lie conscious of her body floating on the top of the bed, and her mind driven to some remote corner of her body, or escaped and gone flitting round the room. All sights were something of an effort, but the sight of Terence was the greatest effort because he forced her to join mind to body in the desire to remember something. She did not wish to remember. It troubled her when people tried to disturb her loneliness. She wished to be alone. She wished for nothing else in the world. Although she had cried, Terence observed Helen's greater hopefulness with something like triumph. In the argument between them, she had made the first sign of admitting herself in the wrong. He waited for Dr. Lesage to come down that afternoon with considerable anxiety, but with the same certainty at the back of his mind that he would in time force them all to admit that they were in the wrong. As usual, Dr. Lesage was sulky in his manner and very short in his answers. To Terence's demand, she seems to be better? He replied, looking at him in an odd way. She has a chance of life. The door shut and Terence walked across to the window. He leant his forehead against the pane. Rachel, he repeated to himself, she has a chance of life. Rachel. How could they say these things of Rachel? Had any one yesterday seriously believed that Rachel was dying? They had been engaged for four weeks. A fortnight ago she had been perfectly well. What could fourteen days have done to bring her from that state to this? To realize what they meant by saying that she had a chance of life, was beyond him, knowing as he did that they were engaged. He turned, still enveloped in the same dreary mist, and walked towards the door. Suddenly he saw it all. He saw the room and the garden, and the trees moving in the air. They could go on without her. She could die. For the first time since she fell ill he remembered exactly what she looked like, and the way in which they cared for each other. The immense happiness of feeling her close to him mingled with a more intense anxiety than he had felt yet. He could not let her die. He could not live without her. But after a momentary struggle the curtain fell again and he saw nothing and felt nothing clearly. It was all going on, going on still, in the same way as before, save for a physical pain when his heart beat and the fact that his fingers were icy cold. He did not realize that he was anxious about anything, 
within his mind he seemed to feel nothing about rachel or about any one or anything in the world he went on giving orders arranging with mrs chailey writing out lists and every now and then he went upstairs and put something quietly on the table outside rachel's door that night dr lesage seemed to be less sulky than usual he stayed voluntarily for a few moments and addressing st john and terence equally as if he did not remember which of them was engaged to the young lady said i consider that her condition to-night is very grave neither of them went to bed or suggested that the other should go to bed they sat in the drawing-room playing piquet with the door open st john made up a bed upon the sofa and when it was ready insisted that terence should lie upon it they began to quarrel as to who should lie on the sofa and who should lie upon a couple of chairs covered with rugs st john forced terence at last to lie down upon the sofa don't be a fool terence he said you'll only get ill if you don't sleep old fellow he began as terence still refused and stopped abruptly fearing sentimentality he found that he was on the verge of tears he began to say what he had long been wanting to say that he was sorry for terence that he cared for him that he cared for rachel did she know how much he cared for her had she said anything asked perhaps he was very anxious to say this but he refrained thinking that it was a selfish question after all and what was the use of bothering terence to talk about such things he was already half asleep but st john could not sleep at once if only he thought to himself as he lay in the darkness something would happen if only this strain would come to an end he did not mind what happened so long as the succession of these hard and dreary days was broken he did not mind if she died he felt himself disloyal in not minding it but it seemed to him that he had no feelings left all night long there was no call or movement except the opening and shutting of the bedroom door once by degrees the light returned into the untidy room at six the servants began to move at seven they crept downstairs into the kitchen and half an hour later the day began again nevertheless it was not the same as the days that had gone before although it would have been hard to say in what the difference consisted perhaps it was that they seemed to be waiting for something there were certainly fewer things to be done than usual people drifted through the drawing-room mr flushing mr and mrs thornbury they spoke very apologetically in low tones refusing to sit down but remaining for a considerable time standing up although the only thing they had to say was is there anything we can do and there was nothing they could do feeling oddly detached from it all terence remembered how helen had said that whenever anything happened to you this was how people behaved was she right or was she wrong he was too little interested to frame an opinion of his own he put things away in his mind as if one of these days he would think about them but not now the mist of unreality had deepened and deepened until it had produced a feeling of numbness all over his body was it his body were those really his own hands 
This morning also, for the first time, Ridley found it impossible to sit alone in his room. He was very uncomfortable downstairs, and as he did not know what was going on, constantly in the way, but he would not leave the drawing-room. Too restless to read, and having nothing to do, he began to pace up and down, reciting poetry in an undertone. Occupied in various ways, now in undoing parcels, now in uncorking bottles, now in writing directions, the sound of Ridley's song and the beat of his pacing worked into the minds of Terence and St. John all the morning, as a half-comprehended refrain. They wrestled up, they wrestled down, they wrestled sore and still, the fiend who blinds the eyes of men, that night he had his will. Like stags full spent, among the bent, they dropped a while to rest. Oh, it's intolerable, Hurst exclaimed, and then checked himself as if it were a breach of their agreement. Again and again Terence would creep halfway up the stairs in case he might be able to glean news of Rachel, but the only news now was of a very fragmentary kind. She had drunk something, she had slept a little, she seemed quieter. In the same way, Dr. Lesage confined himself to talking about details, save once when he volunteered the information that he had just been called in to ascertain, by severing a vein in the wrist, that an old lady of eighty-five was really dead. She had a horror of being buried alive. It is a horror, he remarked that we generally find in the very old, and seldom in the young. They both expressed their interest in what he told them. It seemed to them very strange. Another strange thing about the day was that the luncheon was forgotten by all of them until it was late in the afternoon, and then Mrs. Chailey waited on them, and looked strange too, because she wore a stiff print dress, and her sleeves were rolled up above her elbows. She seemed as oblivious to her appearance, however, as if she had been called out of her bed by a midnight alarm of fire, and she had forgotten, too, her reserve and her composure. She talked to them quite familiarly, as if she had nursed them and held them naked on her knee. She assured them over and over again that it was their duty to eat. The afternoon, being thus shortened, passed more quickly than they expected. Once Mrs. Flushing opened the door, but on seeing them shut it again quickly. Once Helen came down to fetch something, but she stopped as she left the room to look at a letter addressed to her. She stood for a moment turning it over, and the extraordinary and mournful beauty of her attitude struck Terence in the way things struck him now, as something to be put away in his mind and to be thought about afterwards. They scarcely spoke, the argument between them seeming to be suspended or forgotten. Now that the afternoon sun had left the front of the house, Ridley paced up and down the terrace, repeating stanzas of a long poem, in a subdued but suddenly sonorous voice. Fragments of the poem were wafted in at the open window as he passed and repassed. Peor and Balim forsake their temples dim, with that twice-battered god of Palestine, and mooned Astaroth. The sound of these words were strangely discomforting to both the young men, but they had to be borne. As the evening drew on and the red light of the sunset glittered far away on the sea, the same sense of desperation attacked 
both Terence and St. John at the thought that the day was nearly over, and that another night was at hand. The appearance of one light after another in the town beneath them produced in Hirst a repetition of his terrible and disgusting desire to break down and sob. Then the lamps were brought in by Chailey. She explained that Maria, in opening a bottle, had been so foolish as to cut her arm badly, but she had bound it up. It was unfortunate when there was so much work to be done. Chailey herself limped because of the rheumatism in her feet, but it appeared to her mere waste of time to take any notice of the unruly flesh of servants. The evening went on. Dr. Lesage arrived unexpectedly and stayed upstairs a very long time. He came down once and drank a cup of coffee. She is very ill, he said in answer to Ridley's question. All the annoyance had by this time left his manner. He was grave and formal, but at the same time it was full of consideration, which had not marked it before. He went upstairs again. The three men sat together in the drawing-room. Ridley was quite quiet now, and his attention seemed to be thoroughly awakened. Save for little half-voluntary movements and exclamations that were stifled at once, they waited in complete silence. It seemed as if they were at last brought together face to face with something definite. It was nearly eleven o'clock when Dr. Lesage again appeared in the room. He approached them very slowly and did not speak at once. He looked first at St. John and then at Terence and said to Terence, Mr. Hewitt, I think you should go upstairs now. Terence rose immediately leaving the others seated with Dr. Lesage standing motionless between them. Chailey was in the passage outside, repeating over and over again, It's wicked, it's wicked. Terence paid her no attention. He heard what she was saying, but it conveyed no meaning to his mind. All the way upstairs he kept saying to himself, this has not happened to me. It is not possible that this has happened to me. He looked curiously at his own hand on the banisters. The stairs were very steep, and it seemed to take him a long time to surmount them. Instead of feeling keenly, as he knew that he ought to feel, he felt nothing at all. When he opened the door he saw Helen sitting by the bedside. There were shaded lights on the table, and the room, though it seemed to be full of a great many things, was very tidy. There was a faint and not unpleasant smell of disinfectants. Helen rose and gave up her chair to him in silence. As they passed each other their eyes met in a peculiar level glance. He wondered at the extraordinary clearness of her eyes, and at the deep calm and sadness that dwelt in them. He sat down by the bedside, and a moment afterwards heard the door shut gently behind her. He was alone with Rachel, and a faint reflection of the sense of relief that they used to feel when they were left alone possessed him. He looked at her. He expected to find some terrible change in her, but there was none. She looked indeed very thin, and as far as he could see, very tired. But she was the same as she had always been. Moreover, she saw him and knew him. She smiled at him and said, Hello, Terence. The curtain which had been drawn between them for so long vanished immediately. Well, Rachel, he replied in his usual voice, upon which she opened her eyes quite widely and smiled with her familiar smile. 
He kissed her and took her hand. It's been wretched without you, he said. She still looked at him and smiled, but soon a slight look of fatigue or perplexity came into her eyes, and she shut them again. But when we're together we're perfectly happy, he said. He continued to hold her hand. The light being dim, it was impossible to see any change in her face. An immense feeling of peace came over Terence so that he had no wish to move or to speak. The terrible torture and unreality of the last days were over, and he had come out now into perfect certainty and peace. His mind began to work naturally again, and with great ease. The longer he sat there, the more profoundly was he conscious of the peace invading every corner of his soul. Once he held his breath and listened acutely. She was still breathing. He went on thinking for some time. They seemed to be thinking together. He seemed to be Rachel as well as himself. And then he listened again. No, she had ceased to breathe. So much the better. This was death. It was nothing. It was to cease to breathe. It was happiness. It was perfect happiness. They had now what they had always wanted to have, the union which had been impossible while they lived. Unconscious whether he thought the words or spoke them aloud, he said, No two people have ever been so happy as we have been. No one has ever loved as we have loved. It seemed to him that their complete union and happiness filled the room with rings eddying more and more widely. He had no wish in the world left unfulfilled. They possessed what could never be taken from them. He was not conscious that anyone had come into the room, but later, Moments later, or hours later, perhaps, he felt an arm behind him. The arms were round him. He did not want to have arms round him, and the mysterious whispering voices annoyed him. He laid Rachel's hand, which was now cold, upon the counterpane, and rose from his chair, and walked across to the window. The windows were uncurtained, and showed the moon, and a long silver pathway upon the surface of the waves. Why, he said in his ordinary tone of voice, look at the moon. There's a halo round the moon. We shall have rain tomorrow. The arms, whether they were the arms of man or of woman, were round him again. They were pushing him gently towards the door. He turned of his own accord and walked steadily in advance of the arms, conscious of a little amusement at the strange way in which people behaved, merely because someone was dead. He would go if they wished it, but nothing they could do would disturb his happiness. As he saw the passage outside the room, and the table with the cups and the plates, it suddenly came over him that here was a world in which he would never see Rachel again. Rachel! Rachel! he shrieked, trying to rush back to her. But they prevented him, and pushed him down the passage, and into a bedroom far from her room. Downstairs they could hear the thud of his feet on the floor as he struggled to break free, and twice they heard him shout, Rachel! Rachel! End of chapter 25